Um, my name is Kathleen Winters, and I'm the Executive Director for the Northern District Historical Society. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in person and virtually. Um, just a quick reminder for those of you in person, please um, silence your cell phones if you haven't already. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank our distinguished panel for taking time from their very busy lives to be here. And I'd also like to thank historical board members, Judge Thelton Henderson, Ray Marshall, and Grace Yang for their work organizing tonight's program. We are also grateful to our co-sponsors tonight circuit historical society the northern district chapter of the federal bar association and the northern district practice program and special thanks to jared augustus of uc hastings who made the arrangements for this beautiful space we hope you enjoy tonight's program um, please check your email and the zoom chat box for information about how to join both historical societies support our efforts and learn about future programs. Um, and now it's my honor to introduce our moderator, Ray Marshall. I'm just a moderator, the talent's to my left. <laughs> um, so um, hold that applause. Um, thanks, Kathleen. A few things. One is that you'll see four figures, personalities behind me. Judge Henderson came ill this morning. Uh, he's fine, doing well, but considering the weather, the timing, um, it's more important to make sure that we keep our icon healthy. Um, so he's staying uh, in the East Bay, but he's recovering, doing fine. But so instead of four, uh, we have three, but our talent is deep. Uh, our talent is full of experts, and I'm going to talk very little and try to hear from them. Um, I'll do very quick introductions um, to my uh, left um, is Dan Shermanisky, and he said I could call him Erwin, which is hard to do because um, he is both an educator, a teacher, prolific writer, uh, columnist, um, and um, an expert in the topics that we'll be discussing today. Uh, next to Erwin is Pam Carlin. Uh, again, scholar, award-winning teacher at Stanford uh, Law. Um, she is the co-director of Stanford Supreme Court Litigation Clinic, um, and also importantly, currently the principal deputy assistant AG in the Civil Rights Division, and was also a former assistant deputy assistant, uh, deputy counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, so thank you. And next to her is Professor Brian Landsberg. Brian, uh, again, um, not only is a teacher and educator at McGeorge Law, but like others here, also practicing attorney. And prior to joining McGeorge Law School, uh, he was in the Civil Rights Division of the DOJ. And when we start this off, he is going to bring us back in time, which will have a pure um, remembrance to where we are today. Because the first question I'm going to pose is to Brian. And Brian, that goes to what was the state of voting rights for Black people um, prior to the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1965? Give us the lay of the land. Sure. So if you had asked me that question in 1876, I would have said it was great <laughs> because uh, the uh, 15th Amendment had taken effect. The federal government was protecting voting rights and African Americans were voting in large numbers. Uh, they were electing people to the Congress, 22 members of Congress. Uh, they were electing people to state legislatures, over 600 people to state legislatures. Uh, but then all of that changed uh, after uh, the federal troops were withdrawn from the Confederate states. And uh, the Confederate states started uh, passing laws that took the right to vote away, basically, from African Americans. So in 1900, there were 100,000 African Americans registered to vote in Alabama. After the 1901 Constitution was put in place, there were only 96, there were only, excuse me, 96,000 of them were taken off the rolls. So just 4,000 left, or less than 4,000, really. Uh, so then there came a series of, of laws that 
were designed to take the vote away. The grandfather clauses, uh, the discriminatory application of literacy tests, um, uh, white primaries, these were all taken to minimize African-American voting. And the courts would strike one, one device down and then another one would emerge to frustrate African-American efforts to vote. And this was also accompanied by economic and physical intimidation uh, of potential African-American voters. Uh, for example, uh, in 1950s, uh, some African-Americans in Tennessee tried to register to vote. They were sharecroppers and they were kicked off their land. That became an early uh, case from the Civil Rights Division. So then the federal government uh, efforts to restore the vote began with the passage of the 1957 Civil Rights Act. And uh, that created the Civil Rights Division and, uh, and, and allowed it or authorized it to bring voting rights cases, which it started <clears throat> doing. And, uh, but progress came very slowly. The federal district courts judges were reluctant to require change most of them were products of the democratic uh, machine, uh, the, the uh, all white democratic uh, party machine, I mean, and uh, they reflected the, those values, the values of a racial caste system. Uh, and, but there were some judges uh, in the fifth circuit, Judge Frank Johnson in Alabama, who, uh, who did begin to fashion strong relief but the whack-a-mole sort of resistance required going back to court, back to court, back to court over and over again. Uh, and registration was placed in the hands of political appointees who were applying subjective criteria. They would slow down uh, registration process. There were long lines in Selma. You may have seen pictures of them, policed by Sheriff Jim Clark changes in the application forms, trick questions, supporting witness requirements. Uh, and of course the, the murder of civil rights workers in Mississippi and in Alabama. As late as eight, 1965, two Alabama counties that were over 80% black had zero African-American voters. Uh, and three fourths of African-Americans in Alabama were not were not registered to vote. Uh, so then uh, uh, the government started bringing cases. I guess you're going to ask me that question. Well, no, no, Ray, yeah, I mean, I was going to go to the notion that we have a lot of lawyers, law students, judges, um, the Civil Rights Division um, over the years has been um, either uh, lauded or criticized for either enforcing or not enforcing civil rights, depending upon what administration. Back in the day, how did you go to court and uh, prove those cases? Um, what kind of standard were you looking for? Uh, first of all, Judge Henderson would have told you, because we've discussed this, that when he started, which was a year before I started, as a lawyer in the Civil Rights Division, the division only had 37 lawyers. So they were spread very thin. But we would prove uh, discrimination basically the way one proves a case, many kinds of cases with paper and with witnesses. So the paper, uh, first we had to bring suits to enforce demands for voter records. We were entitled to inspect the uh, records of the registrars. <clears throat> then we would, uh, the FBI would uh, take photos of the, of the records and uh, I spent my first month of uh, work in the Civil Rights Division with my head in a microfilm machine, reading application forms and dictating into a dictaphone what, what those forms showed. Um, uh, that sometimes the records have been destroyed in, in violation of federal and state laws. That happened in El Elmore County, Alabama, the first case I worked on. But we would then compare the white forms and the black forms. Uh, uh, sometimes we had trouble with that because uh, the registrars didn't always 
uh, put race identification on the forms, but uh, we were looking to see what forms were accepted and what forms were rejected and uh, uh, analyze them. This is what John Doerr called the romance of the records. And uh, we would then uh, create statistics about uh, the, the, uh, the vote. Uh, how many African-Americans had tried to register? How many of them had succeeded? How many whites had tried to register? How many of them had succeeded? And the uh, courts have said that statistics speak loud and the courts will listen. So then with witnesses, uh, we, we had three kinds of witnesses. We had African-American witnesses who had tried to register to vote. Um, we'd have to try to find them. We learned our way around the rural South, got stuck in the mud a lot. Uh, we would use the FBI a little bit, but they were not very effective with African-Americans who basically did not trust them. Uh, building trust was really important. Felton Henderson was, I believe, the only African-American lawyer in the division who, who went out in the field in the uh, early 1960s. Uh, so most of most of us were were white and most of us were males. Brian, I'm curious. When we look at the history of the civil rights, there's a lot of discussion and well-documented. When you look at Brown v. Board and Thurgood Marshall talking about how picking the right cases along the years, there's a strategy to get to Brown. At Justice and Voting Rights era, was there a strategy on terms of cases that you were going to pick um, in terms of what the legal issue was or what case had the best facts? What, what was the strategy and what was the impact that sort of led then uh, to getting the Voting Rights Act passed in 65? Well, one strategy would be try to find the, the most favorable judges. So we would go to the Middle District of Alabama where Frank Johnson sat before we would go to the Southern District of Alabama where Daniel Thomas sat, but uh, sometimes we had no choice. In Mississippi, there were no favorable uh, judges. So there, it was partly uh, uh, a result of where the civil rights workers, uh, the activists had, been active and so where there were lots of African-American applicants. Uh, if there were lots of African-American applicants who had been denied, we knew we could make, we could make a case. And um, we'd be able to show that the standard that was applied to the African-Americans was different from the standard that was applied to white applicants. White illiterates were being uh, registered while African-Americans with college degrees, master's degrees, teachers were being turned down. Judge Johnson is famous, well-respected, received ABA awards for his bravery and following the rule of law. How were the appellate courts uh, treating uh, these cases? The, once, you, once you got passed and had a favorable ruling or even a bad ruling, what was the appellate process at that point? Most of our cases were in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which covered a lar uh, which covered what is now the Fifth Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit area, and uh, we had a had a wonderful set of judges there. We had some judges who were not not uh, particularly helpful, but we had uh, Judge Wisdom, Judge Brown, uh, uh, Judge Tuttle, some really terrific judges who were very inventive, came up with what's called freezing relief, uh, concepts that then helped, uh, helped uh, influence the shape of the Voting Rights Act. Maybe a question to both you and Pam, because Pam, you're with um, the division. What was the role and why the heavy reliance um, on the division as opposed to the private sector. I mean, now we have so many interest groups, so many uh, private bar um, attorneys, a lot of nonprofits, uh, was Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, um, Equal Justice, um, ACLU. Um, and as I recall, there was some initial criticism of justice under Kennedy as not doing enough, not fast enough. 
Um, and not to be overly cynical, but it said it took a Southern white male president from the South, Johnson, to pass civil rights laws. So can you both speak to that? So it, it's, it's great to be here. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that until 1976, there were no attorney's fees for any kinds of these cases. So if you're trying to figure out how do you build a practice, one of the things, if you look at the work, for example, that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund was doing in the South at the time, uh, they relied on cooperating attorneys who were basically the handful of Black lawyers in the South uh, who did this along with having a general practice. That is, there weren't, there weren't, there wasn't a civil rights bar to, to speak of. And the Lawyers Committee was actually created um, in the 1960s by the request of President Kennedy, who wanted to have uh, lawyers at large firms uh, helping out with various kinds of work. But remember, this is a period in the civil rights movement where it's not just about voting rights, but they're also suing over school desegregation. They're suing over public accommodations. Uh, they're defending uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of criminal cases that are coming out of the sit-ins and the like. And the, the lawyers were spread very, very thin. Um, and the question of whether, vote, you know, on the one hand, voting rights are preservative of all other rights. So it makes a certain amount of sense to put a lot of work into voting rights. But there was also an entire civil rights movement that required um, defense by the members of the bar who were committed to uh, civil rights enforcement altogether. So it was th there were a lot of fronts uh, at, the, at the same time. I, I would just add that, uh, that I think that. You know, when the 15th Amendment was passed, there was, a, there was a federal enforcement mechanism. The U.S. Department of Justice, which was created in 1870, uh, was bringing uh, voter cases back then. Uh, the, um, actually, the grandfather clause case was brought, was a prosecution by the government. And I think that the notion is that the denial of the right to vote is a violation of our most fundamental values of this country and that it is a public matter. It is not just a matter for private suits. Uh, and uh, to just uh, something else you said, Ray, well, I crossed a picket line once of SNCC people who, who were carrying signs that said, there's a, there's a town in Mississippi called Liberty. There's a department in Washington called Justice. So that, was, that hurt. You know, and, and the Supreme Court had kind of chopped the legs out from under federal enforcement of voting rights in the Reeves case and the Colfax massacre case um, by essentially making it very hard to prove. You had to prove up that the reason people had been denied the right to vote um, was because of their race. And that was sometimes very hard, very hard to do. The cases that Brian worked on at the beginning of his career took thousands and thousands of hours. Um, and we'll be talking later about the parallel to cases today, but the same thing is true of the vote denial cases today. It takes thousands and thousands of hours of expert witness time to match all of the voting records to the IDs that states have to show disparities in I rates of holding IDs or the like. It takes thousands of hours to go through all of the ballots that were cast out of precinct to show that those people were actually qualified to vote in the jurisdiction and the like. So these are also cases that if, if you're a private lawyer, you need a lot of resources to bring a lot of these cases, um, especially if you're trying to do systemic change as opposed to just getting one particular voter uh, on the rolls. Well, I see, Aaron, you've been nodding your head um, as to uh, some of the comments that uh, Pam uh, and Brian uh, have said, one of the questions for all three of you, um, I, like you, come from a generation where um, we moved from um, Negro to African-American to Black um, over the years and very much in activist views. Compare um, the importance of activism, um, demonstrations, and um, they like uh, to get the Voting Rights Act passed. And you it's such a pleasure to be part of this amazing panel. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 wouldn't have been passed without activism. Probably seen the movie Selma, which tells the story in a very powerful way of the pressure 
that was put on President Johnson to support the Voting Rights Act of 1965 when he was reluctant to do so. But I think this is the story of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. It required the activism of the sit-ins that Pam was talking about, or the march in Selma that was so crucial for Voting Rights Act. It also took the litigation that was brought by the NAACP. It took Congress acting in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so that's why when I've heard discussions of, well, was it about the litigation, or was it about the legislation, or was it about the activism? The answer has to be it was about all of those. And the results that were so, so positive and unprecedented since Reconstruction wouldn't have happened without all of those. So, was there internal divisions at the division with regard to how hard to push the timeline? There was always that view of wait, not now, wait, not now. Uh, what was it? <laughs> Well, you know, I'd say the young lawyers, which I was at the time, thought that the old guys were going too slow. We would, we would make proposals and they would sit on somebody's desk. So sure, there was a little bit of that, but uh, we, we were actually working so hard uh, and uh, spending so much time in court that uh, it, what, that wasn't really a, a major issue. So we moved then, Pam, we get through the 60s, and I don't know, Brian, whether you wanted to um, comment at all on Bloody Sunday, uh, the march from Selma to uh, Montgomery for voting rights registration, um, but that's in, you know, indelible in history. We have the footage of that. We have John Lewis. It, it, was, it was caught by ABC News, which put her back then they they didn't have you couldn't just there were no computers to to uh do this so they put the tapes on a or the the kinescope on a, a plane and took it to new york and they were showing a movie called judgment at nuremberg that night and they interrupted them which was about the nazi war criminal trials and they interrupted that to show what happened at, at, at selma so it caught a large audience of people who were really shocked. They didn't know that sort of stuff was happening. Um, as an aside, I'm not supposed to be doing any speaking here. I read that uh, King criticized Look Magazine uh, for stopping to help John Lewis um, as he was being struck by police. And the criticism was that he should not have done that. He should have kept taking photos uh, because it was the photos that were needed to show America what was happening um, and not to um, you know, intervene, but he wanted to have the pictures tell a thousand stories. Yeah, there had been a similar incident uh, 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 a month before in, in Marion, Alabama at night. And so there, and the only TV camera there was uh, broken by, uh, by some white thugs. So that, that incident where Jimmy Lee Jackson was killed was not, uh, just wasn't filmed. So people didn't know about it. So Pam, we, we know a lot about the 60s. We seem to hear less, read less about post 60s and to you know, 2000 and 2010, 12, where we are. Um, <clears throat> what happened during that period in terms of voting rights? Sure. So the, the 1965 Civil Rights Act, which was the first major voting rights act since since Reconstruction. I mean, there had been a, a few small pieces in the 60 Act and the 64 Act. The 65 Act was really critical. And it had uh, initially two provisions that were absolutely crucial. The first one of these suspended the use of literacy tests and similar devices throughout the South, uh, initially for five years then for another five years, then the ban on literacy tests was made nationwide and permanent. And one of the reasons this is so important is because even a fairly administered literacy test in the 1960s or 1970s would have screened out huge numbers of black and Latino voters because they had gone to segregated schools in the South and the Southwest that didn't provide them with an education. So they couldn't have passed a literacy test, even if it had been given fairly. And for the most part, they weren't given fairly. So the first big thing was 
the suspension of literacy tests, and then the Supreme Court struck down poll taxes uh, almost immediately after that. No, that. Those have been the two major devices that were being used in the South in the 1960s to keep people from voting. But the genius of the Voting Rights Act, and here I'll put in a pitch for Brian's book, which is called Free at Last to Vote, the uh, Alabama origins of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, was that having gotten rid of those tests, the, uh, the act Im imposed something called the preclearance requirement, which was in any of these jurisdictions that had been using a test or device and in which political participation had been depressed by that, which basically meant almost the entire Confederacy and then a couple of random places around the rest of the country initially. They weren't, not only was their literacy test suspended, but they couldn't make any other change with respect to voting without first going to Washington DC and either persuading the Justice Department or a three judge federal district court in the DDC, not their home court in the DDC, that the change they wanted to make would have neither a discriminatory purpose nor a discriminatory effect. And this was one of the most innovative and powerful things ever done to protect voting rights because it got rid of the whack-a-mole. So when, for example, um, jurisdictions in Mississippi, right after black people got the vote in Mississippi, started changing the rules for how they were going to elect or making positions appointive, the Supreme Court said, you can't do that without first proving, with the burden of proof being on you. And for those of you who are law students, you know, the burden of proof is like a really important aspect of this. So the burden of proof was shifted from the victims of discrimination to the perpetrators. They couldn't put their laws into effect until those laws got preclearance. And almost, uh, almost overnight, this made a huge difference. The federal government also sent registrars to the South to put black voters on the, on the rolls. And those registrars in Southern states registered more people to vote in two years than had been registered in the previous 50. So with the political will and the judicial will to enforce the act, the act had a huge effect on what were called first generation voting rights claims. That is the right to cast a register, to cast a ballot and have it counted. But almost, uh, uh, it's fortuitous, but also quite fortunate the reapportionment revolution of the 1960s meant that after every census, every one of the congressional districts in the country, state legislative districts, city council districts, school board districts had to be redrawn because people have shifted around and they're not, they don't have equal populations anymore. They had to pre-clear that as well. And the upshot of that was that the Justice Department objected to plans that diluted minority voting strength. So uh, you could, if you were drawing a new plan in an area that had a large black or Latino or Native American population, it, you had to draw districts that would enable those groups to elect candidates of their choice. That takes us to 1976. Uh, in 1976, the Supreme Court decided a case called Washington against Davis, which was not a case about voting at all. But that case held that the Constitution, if you want to bring a constitutional race discrimination claim under the 14th Amendment, you have to show that the law was enacted with a discriminatory purpose and not just that it had a discriminatory effect. And in 1980, the Supreme Court applied that to uh, voting rights claims, vote dilution claims. And it's often hard if you're trying to show something that was done 30 or 40 years earlier, or if you're trying to show something and the legislators are smart enough not to say why they're doing it, they would always say it's for good government reasons, right? The reason we want to use at-large elections instead of districts is for good government reasons, to get rid of ward politics. And they held this in a case called City of Mobile against Bolden. And it then took hundreds of hours of expert witness time to go back, expert historians this time, to go back and show that in 1909, when Mobile had adopted at-large voting, it had done so in part to suppress the ability of the Black community in Mobile to elect candidates of its choice. So in 1982, the Supreme Court, amend, uh, uh, Congress amended the Voting Rights Act to say that it would violate the act, section two of the act, to use a voting standard or a practice or procedure that had the result of denying minority voters an equal opportunity to elect candidates of their choice, regardless of the purpose behind it. And that led to a second round of what were called sort of second generation cases where uh, 
you know, people swept across the South litigating, um, litigating cases to force them to use districted elections and to create districts that Black uh, voters in the South and Latino voters in the Southwest could elect their candidates from. And you saw, and this is, this is literally two orders of magnitude more Black elected officials in Southern states than had been true uh, five years earlier. So that kind of takes us up to uh, the beginning of this century. Well, I mean, you made reference to the 65 um, Act, which was landmark legislation being amended. I think I read somewhere where I think it's been, um, the Voting Rights Act's been amended maybe five times. Yeah, so it was um, amended in 1970, 75, 82, and 2006. What was the import of those amendments? As, what were the, some of the highlights of so, those amendments? Yeah, so the 1970, the 1971 extended preclearance pre had originally only been a five-year deal because they, they, you know, people were like super optimistic well, we solved the problem in five years and then we don't have to worry about it. But it tur turns out, you know, this is this is not a problem that's easily solved that way. So in 1970, the extension, the major extension of the act was simply to say we're going to keep preclearance in effect for another five years. 1975, they made the literacy ban nationwide permanent, which made a difference. And in 1975, they looked to how voting had happened in the 1972 election to see which jurisdictions should be covered. And that's when four counties in California came under the act um, and preclearance was required for those counties. Um, in 1982, the, they extended preclearance again till 2007 um, and they put in the results test. And then in 2006, they extended preclearance again for another 25 years uh, and they changed slightly uh, the standard for uh, discriminatory purpose in a preclearance case. So in the last year, two years, since we've been living with COVID, uh, we've had a presidential election. Um, we're looking at 21, looking at midterms. Voting rights is in the news almost every day. Um, lessons learned in terms of voting rights generally and the, what I see as um, disproportionate impact on poor and minority and black. So that's a question for all three of you, but uh, ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing about it. And then I'd love to hear what Brian, Brian and Erwin have to say about it as well. Um, you know, if you looked in the year, say 1999, virtually no states had voter ID requirements. There was bipartisan uh, support for voting rights. The act was repeatedly amended and extended every time signed by a Republican president, 1970, 1975, 1982, all Republican presidents. Um, but after the 2000 election, things seemed to change quite dramatically. Um, and you started hearing all of this specters of fraud stuff that really hadn't been discussed very much before that. Voting rights became much more of a partisan issue than it had been previously. Before it had been a regional issue, I think it's fair yeah, to say, right. but not a partisan issue. Um, and so you started to see ID requirements being enacted in various states. And whatever fraud there is in American elections is relatively low. It's really minuscule. And virtually none of it is in-person voter impersonation. That is, if you think about it from the perspective of an individual who, who, who's thinking about voting, the chances of your casting the decisive vote in an election are relatively small. There's actually a sociologist who cal calculated you're more likely to be killed in an automobile accident going to the polls than to cast the vote that actually determines the outcome of an election. Um, the fraud that's committed is committed by parties when it's committed. And it's usually in very small elections where 20 or 30 votes for a city council member might make a difference. But the specter of fraud has led to a huge amount of restrictions on the right to vote. And it's it's really, again, becoming a regional issue, not South North, but, but a regional issue nonetheless. So for example, in California, we have uh, absolute right to be a permanent vote by mail voter. I mean, huge, huge proportion of Californians now, their ballot is sent to them by the government 
which takes the responsibility for figuring out which ballot to send them, mails it to them, they can mail it back, they can drop it off in a variety of different places. Some states don't allow virtually anybody to vote absentee. New York, oddly enough, is one of the most restrictive states in the country on absentee voting. In Texas, really the only people who have an absolute right to vote absentee are people over the age of 65. If you're under the age of 65, very hard to vote absentee. Lots of states require huge amounts of ID. I have voted in Connecticut, New York, Virginia, and California. Not all at the same time, I want to <laughs> assure you. Um, but in different elections, in different years when I lived there, I've never been asked for an, uh, any form of identification at the polls. By contrast, Texas has a list of like nine, four, tried to put in nine forms of identification, and those were the only ones you could use. Oddly enough, it they allowed you to show your concealed carry permit, but not your student ID at the University of Texas. So, so yeah, everyone else. Yeah. Please Pam do. did a great job of describing the Voting Rights Act and tracing what happens after it. And she mentions how it was supposed to expire in 2007 and Congress votes in 2006 to extend it. I think the vote in the Senate was 98 to nothing. The vote in the House was overwhelming. The noted liberal George W. Bush signs it into law. And then on June 25th, 2013, in Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court essentially invalidates the preclearance requirement. The court says that the formula comes from the 1982 law and Congress hadn't changed it in 2006, so it's old data. But of course, there's nothing that requires that Congress use new or current or any specific data in devising the formula. I think one of the things I find most puzzling about Shelby County is what constitutional provision or principle did Section 5 or Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act violate. And the most you can find in Chief Justice Roberts' opinion is it says it violates a principle of equal state sovereignty, that Congress has to treat all states the same. Of course, where in the Constitution does it say that? I'm not an originalist, but if anything is clear about the intent of the Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment is that it didn't believe that Congress had to treat all states the same because that's the Congress that created Reconstruction and created military rule over the South. This ends preclearance immediately states like Texas and North Carolina put into effect the very voting restrictions that have been denied preclearance. There have been hundreds of instances of preclearance being denied, probably thousands of instances where state and local governments didn't even try because they couldn't get preclearance. And Pam spoke accurately and powerfully about the importance of preclearance in it's gone after 2013. Justice Kagan in her dissent in Brnovich in July said that from 1965 when the Voting Rights Act was adopted until Shelby County, there've been continual increases in black voter participation in the United States. Since Shelby County she says in major elections, it had gone down 2.5%, the first decrease since 1965. But the story of course, with regard to what's happened to the Voting Rights Act doesn't stop there. And this is key in answering your question, because another crucial aspect of the Voting Rights Act, as Pam says, was Section 2, amended in 1982, that says that state and local governments can't have election systems that have a discriminatory effect against minority voters. And the Supreme Court in Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee on July 1st, 2021, dramatically weakened, I think it's fair to say, gutted Section 2. This is a case that came out of Arizona. Arizona adopted a couple of provisions that were being challenged. One said that in order for a vote to be counted, it had to be cast in a person's own precinct. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, an en banc decision found that that had a discriminatory effect because statistics showed that polling places were much more frequently moved in communities of color than in predominantly white communities. The other provision that was challenged said that an absentee ballot had to be turned in by the voter or by a relative of the voter. And the Ninth Circuit in its en banc decision found that this would have a discriminatory effect, especially with regard to Native American communities where mail service less available. That the Ninth Circuit even found there was evidence of discriminatory intent. And the Supreme Court six to three reverses the Ninth Circuit. Justice Alito writes the opinion for the court joined by the conservatives Justice Kagan writes a passionate dissent, joined by Justices Breyer and Sotomayor. And Justice Alito says that the court needs to give guidance to the lower courts, and so it's going to give five guideposts. And what's interesting about these is none 
are found in the statute. The conservative just in the court always emphasized textualism in looking at the plain language of the statute. And none of the five things that Justice Alito pointed to are there. I mean, the fifth that he says is you need to look at the state's interest, especially the state's interest in preventing fraud. There's nothing in the Voting Rights Act that says you weigh the burdens on minority voters against preventing fraud. Um, and the five factors together are going to make it so much harder to prove Section 2 violations. So this goes to your question. If you put together Shelby County that ends preclearance in Brnovich, which makes it so much more difficult to bring Section 2 challenges, it's going to be much more difficult to have effective challenges and stop the kinds of discriminatory laws that you were referring to. Well, Two-part question. One, step back and help um, us better understand the relationship between the federal and the state control over elections. A lot of people think that, geez, well, we have federal laws, federal controls the nation as a whole. How come federal government just can't have an election law that says we all get to vote, pure and simple? So explain that sort of relationship. And then I would like to follow up how damaging is the Bronovich case to all of the state attempts to limit, to limit voting rights? Generally, elections are held and run at the state level. It's the states, of course, that determine where the polling places are going to be. It's the states that staff the polling places, the states that count the votes. But there are federal laws that regulate that, the most important of which is the Voting Rights Act. And so states aren't allowed in having election practices or drawing election districts to do so in a way that has a discriminatory effect against minority voters. And this leads to the second question in terms of Brnovich. I think Brnovich is going to have a devastating effect on the ability to challenge laws that have a discriminatory effect against minority voters. Now, I have no doubt that these laws also have a discriminatory intent, but as Brian and Pam said, it's so hard to prove discriminatory intent. That's why allowing discriminatory impact should be enough. And yet Brnovich makes that more difficult looking at all five of the factors that Justice Alito articulates individually and collectively make it harder to prove a violation of the Voting Rights Act. And so I think it's 18 states that have adopted laws in the last year that impose restrictions on voting. They're all states with Republican legislatures. Before um, my next question, one administrative matter that I know Kathleen's probably saying, how come he hasn't announced that yet? Your CLE code um, is nine one nine six five. 1965 for- How'd you pick that? <laughs> <laughs> we keep it simple. We keep it simple. Uh, so for registration, as well as for um, attendance and CLE credit, 1965, and I'll announce it again at the end. And if I'm doing my job right, we're gonna to try to hold five minutes at the end for questions. Um, so don't feel that you won't get the opportunity. All right. Um, so I think it was you, Pam, who made reference to gerrymandering. Um, and I think both you and Erwin also talked about the impact of the census. Erwin, can you expand on the impact of that? Because we just, in the news in the last several months, have been talking about the census um, and cases and the impact of that. As Pam said, after each census, there has to be new districting done. It's done for seats in Congress. It's done for seats in the state legislature. It's done for city councils and boards of supervisors where there are districts. And this goes back to your earlier question. This is all done at the state and local level, but has to comply with federal law. And I think here it's important to draw a distinction between partisan gerrymandering and say racial gerrymandering, though often it's difficult to separate the two. With regard to partisan gerrymandering, this is where the political party that controls the legislature draws election districts to maximize safe seats for that party. It's where, say, a Republican-controlled state legislature draws election districts to maximize safe seats for Republicans, or a Democratic-controlled city council draws election districts to maximize safe seats for Democrats. As you know, it's nothing new. It takes its name from a governor of Massachusetts early in American history, Elbridge Geary, who engaged in the practice. But what's different now is sophisticated computer programs 
make it possible to engage in partisan gerrymandering far more effectively than ever before. There was a Supreme Court case about this almost three years ago in June 2019, Rucho versus Common Cause. It came from North Carolina. North Carolina is basically a purple state. It went for Obama in 2008, Romney in 2012, Trump in 2016 and 20, but always by very close margins. Republicans gained control of the North Carolina legislature, and they said they wanted to draw congressional districts to give Republicans 10 of 13 seats. And they said if they could figure a way of giving Republicans more than that, they would do it. They had 3,000 maps drawn by the computer in terms of how to draw the election districts, and they chose the one that they thought would give Republicans 10 of 13 seats. It worked. In 2016, Democrats and Republicans got almost the same number of votes for congressional seats in North Carolina, but Republicans won 10 of 13 seats. And a three-judge federal district court declared that unconstitutional. But the Supreme Court five to four reversed and said the challenges to partisan gerrymandering are non-justiciable political questions. They can't be brought in federal court. And this then means that states that don't have independent district commissions can engage in partisan gerrymandering without needing to worry about a federal court challenge. Now, there can still be challenges in state courts under state constitutions. And just this year, state Supreme Courts in North Carolina and Ohio struck down their partisan gerrymandering as violating the state constitutions. But that's one thing that we're talking about with regard to districting. And I think Rucho is just a terrible decision. Justice Kagan in her dissent says, in a democracy, it's supposed to be voters who choose their elected officials. Partisan gerrymandering means elected officials are choosing their voters. Now, the other thing that can go on is with regard to racial gerrymandering and drawing election districts to disadvantage a racial group, or could be to try to advantage a racial group. And this is where Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act becomes so important in bringing a basis for challenging the use of race in drawing election districts. Um, and it's where Section 5 and free clearance used to be so important. But here, too, I think the Supreme Court in its Brnovich decision may make it much more difficult. Brnovich was not about districting. It was about the time, place, and manner of elections. But I worry about what it is, uh, suggests where the court's going to go with regard to districting. I mean, and one thing that, you, that, that has happened as well is, you know, the, the thing that Section 5 did was it said you can't put a discriminatory plan into place. Indeed, you can't put any plan into place until you show it's non-discriminatory. But with the disappearance of Section 5, states now can put the plans into effect. And the Supreme Court earlier this year in a case called um, Mer Merrill against Milligan um, said essentially that um, once you get too close to an election, federal courts should not enjoin the election or, or order a remedy into place. But what they did is they said in essentially February of 2022, that it's too late now to challenge the districts that are going to be used for the 2022 election next November, because primary elections and qualifying of candidates and like, and what that essentially does is it flips what Section 5 did on its head, which is now it says you get one free bite at the apple, no matter how illegal your districting plan might be, courts can't enjoin it. And you're already starting to see a number of uh, district courts around the country saying, I'm going to hear the case in front of me, you know, and if I if I need to put into place a preliminary injunction, I'll do it, but I can't do it for this upcoming election. And that that creates a tremendous, a tremendous problem because, uh, you know, once somebody's elected, it's much easier for them to get reelected from the district than it is for them to get elected for the first time. And if I could just add to that. This is a situation where a three-judge federal district court in Alabama found that the districting likely violated Section 2. Two of the three judges were appointed by President Trump and are very conservative. One had been appointed by President Clinton. And if you just look at the statistics in terms of the percentage of the Alabama population that's African-American compared to the number of districts where you had an African-American majority, there was a dr dramatic disparity um, and the Supreme Court comes in and it, it invoked a, a case and it was a 2007 ruling in a case called Purcell versus Gonzalez, where the Supreme Court said, we don't want federal courts to interfere with elections too soon before the election. 
And we saw that in the 2020 election in the Wisconsin primary, where a federal judge just days before the primary expanded how long it could be for absentee ballots to be turned in. But that was just days before the election. This is months in advance. I mean, the only reason that Justice Kavanaugh gave, and he wrote for himself and one other justice in the Merrill versus Milligan case, was it was too close before the election. It's worth noting that Chief Justice Roberts dissented along with Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. And I think Pam is absolutely right. The practical effect of this will be there will never be the ability to challenge districting for the first elections held after the districting is done, no matter how egregious, no matter how racist, no matter how unconstitutional, because it's going to always be deemed too close to the election if months before the election is enough to trigger for versus Gonzalez. A, a student of, of, of ours, uh, my wife and I were just got finished teaching this material, and a student of ours asked us, well, does this mean that voting is not a right, but just a privilege now? And I think that's... Well, we're sort of, we're sort of going back, I mean, you know, in some ways we're going back to the Supreme Court's decision in Minor against Happersett, which was in 1873, where they said, we are unanimously of the opinion that the Constitution uh, confers the right of suffrage on no one. Um, and what they, what, what they meant by that, and if you look at the Constitution itself, it's almost all of the voting protections the, the, that are ex explicitly mentioned in the Constitution are negative ones. It's not you get the right to vote. It's just you can't deny the right to vote to somebody because they're uh, they don't pay a poll tax, or you can't deny the right to vote to somebody because of sex, or because of race, or uh, for people over the age of eighteen because of age. It's not you get the right to vote. The, the the federal right to vote is completely a piggyback off of the right to vote for the lower house of the state legislature, basically. At the risk of having doom and gloom. Uh, before we open up to questions. President Biden at a State of the Union speech talked about the significance and importance of the Voting Rights Act, implored Congress to bring legislation, John Lewis Act and other legislation forward, um, whether it's uh, Alabama, Georgia, in the midterms, we pick up the paper every day as we were preparing for this. As to each of you, um, are you optimistic, less than optimistic, that we will have new legislation? Um, and if so, when? And if not, why not? Uh, I'll go back to something Irwin said uh, earlier and say it's going to be the same thing this time around, which is the way we got the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was a political movement. Uh, and there has to be a political movement that makes it more costly for Congress not to enact voting rights legislation than to enact it. And until you get that, you're not going to get you're not going to get fundamental protections for the right to vote out of out of the national out, out of Congress. You know, in 1962, uh, <clears throat> Robert Moses, one of the, the co-chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, went to Sunflower County, Mississippi, where he met uh, people and, and encouraged them to register to vote. And one of the was named Fannie Lou Hamer. And, uh, and uh, she said that I didn't even know that I had a right to vote. I didn't know that I could vote uh, until Bob Moses came, came here. So I do think that, um, you know, that, there, that, that that kind of activism is what made the difference. Um, and uh, I just want to just, add that when the Voting Rights Act passed, it, it made an enormous difference in the lives of the people in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and the other Southern states. Um, uh, there, are, and the, uh, there are paved roads in the black neighborhood in Marion, Alabama, which used to have dirt roads. And there are covered sewers where there used to be open sewers. Uh, and, and there are African-American judges and district attorneys and so on uh, in, the, in the county courthouse in Marion. So um, those things did make an enormous difference. And, and I, I agree we need another, uh, another movement in order to bring it about again, because the Congress is not going to, certainly the Senate is not going to move otherwise.
Well, I agree very much with what Pam and Brian said. I think we've got to also remember, it was just a few weeks ago that there was a bill in Congress that passed the House of Representatives, and it would have passed the Senate if the Democrats were willing to change the rules with regard to the filibuster to get it passed. But because two Democratic senators, Manchin and Cinema, wouldn't go along with changing the filibuster, it wouldn't get passed. And so I don't know a way, absent the Democrats changing the rules of the filibuster, that it's going to get adopted. Because and this goes to something that Pam said earlier, how much voting is now looked at through a partisan lens? Republicans believe that they are better off by suppressing the vote, especially the vote in minority communities. And they do so in the name of we're preventing fraud. And Democrats believe that the real problem is voter suppression and they want to expand the availability of voting. And so they want the Voting Rights Act to be adopted. And I don't know politically how it will be possible unless the Democrats are willing to change the filibuster for this kind of pro-democracy legislation. Sounds like to the streets again. <laughs> um, we have time for uh, questions. Um, if anyone, um, and don't be shy. Um, please. What are the chances of simply having a very simple federal law that enabled mail-in voting for all federal elections? So there, there's no there's no legal barrier to that because the Supreme Court, even as late as the nine, as the 2010s, said if you're regulating the time, place, or manner of an election on which there's a federal candidate on the ballot. Congress has plenary power to do that. So if Congress wanted tomorrow to pass a law saying every American needs to have a ballot mailed to them by the local election officials, and it has to be postage prepaid, and you get to mail it back, they could do, they could do that. It's the political will. It's not, it's not, there's no legal impediment there. It's purely a question of the political will. Do we know if that has been proposed? Uh, there, yeah, I mean, there, there was a version of part of the For the People Act, I believe that it, that would have given every voter the right to vote by to vote by mail. It wasn't one that required them to send you the ballot, but it would have required them to allow you to vote by mail. I'm not sure that in reality it helps the Democrats more than the Republicans to do that, but the Republicans yeah. perceive that it helps the Democrats more than the Republicans. And so the Republicans aren't going to let it get through the Senate. Yeah, there was some really good empirical work done that suggested when in, in the couple of California counties that went to mandatory vote by mail for a while, it, it didn't change. It didn't change the relative um, relative partisan breakdown. Okay, question. Go ahead. Thank you. This has been great. As you mentioned, some states use independent commissions to draw um, congressional district lines. How clear is it that that is a permissible uh, mechanism? And if a case came to the Supreme Court tomorrow, would that face challenges? In his majority opinion in Rucho versus Common Cause, Chief Justice Roberts explicitly approved of the ability of states to create independent district commissions. Now, it perhaps becomes a more complicated question because there was an earlier case in terms of whether or not this takes away legislative power and that was five to four with Roberts in dissent and whether or not the legislature is the only body that can do this is something that I think is going to come to the Supreme Court. There was a petition filed last week from the North Carolina Supreme Court decision that argues the legislature has the exclusive power but at least based on what Roberts says in Rucho there he praises or at least says States can have independent district commissions. Yeah, and there's there's no doubt that states can do independent redistricting commissions for everything other than Congress, because right. the only thing that would raise a federal constitutional question is whether the reference in um, the reference in Article One, Section Two, is a reference to just the legislatures. Sure. So I'm curious, uh, you know. The Supreme Court's obviously a hostile place for voting rights at the moment. The legislature appears to lack political will. What's the strategy or the roadmap in your department and for your team, for private practor, private practitioners, or kind of public interest nonprofit organizations? How are you fighting the voting rights fight? So we're doing a lot of litigation in places where we think we can win because we think we have the evidence that should persuade a court. Um, you can't give up on litigation altogether. Um, but you have to be you have to be strategic in where you bring suits, in what claims you bring. Um, 
you know, you, you, you have to look at some of the other laws. I mean, as Roman said, the Voting Rights Act is the primary, is, is the, you know, is the most important, I think, of the federal laws that protect the right to vote, but there are a bunch of other ones. So for example, right now, the department is litigating under section 208 of the Voting Rights Act, which hasn't been litigated much, which is about the right of every voter to receive assistance from the person of the voter's choice. Um, we are using the materiality provision of the 1964 Act, which says that a state can't reject uh, a, a voting paper, which could be a registration application or an application for an absentee ballot or the ballot itself because of immaterial errors, errors that aren't material to whether the voter is qualified to vote. So, you know, people sometimes they transpose a digit uh, in their birth date or they transpose a digit in their ID number. That doesn't go to whether they're qualified to vote or not. You shouldn't reject those ballots. So there are, you know, we bring cases under the National Voter Registration Act um, for failure to count ballots that should have been counted under state law, under the Help America Vote Act and the like. So there are, you know, you, you need to you need to think about creative ways of doing things. And as Erwin also suggested, people should be going to state court in a lot of these places because the state constitutions often have very affirmative protections of the right to vote. Pennsylvania, for example, has a free and fair elections clause in its constitution. And so you argue it's not a free and fair election if because of COVID, I can't get my ballot back in time because it's taking too long to get it to me. We have one last question that's come in um, online. Um, actually, I see a, more coming in, but we're going to, um, before we close, and it's a question for all of you um, that is being asked. Um, and it is that it appears that the Purcell principle is getting increasingly used um, from COVID changes last election to redistricting challenges recently. Can the panel speak to whether this trend is likely to continue amplify um, and what the implications would be? Well, it looks, it certainly looks that way from reading the Merrill opinion and, and uh, uh, I think, as Pam indicated earlier, it means essentially that uh, that the state gets one free bite at the apple of uh, passing a discriminatory law for one election, and then after later elections, the uh, the, the law will be stricken down. I think all I'd add is, if you go back to Purcell. It's a per curiam opinion with very little reasoning soon before an election in Arizona. And now it's taken on this life of its own. And as you point out in the Merrill versus Milligan case, as Pam said, even months before the election, they're saying the federal courts can't get involved. And it, it's very troubling. And when you see Chief Justice Roberts, the author of Shelby County, being very troubled by it, I think you see how disturbing it is. Last question for those on the line. We're going to end here, and then we're going to be able to, um, besides thanking the panel, have a few minutes afterwards for um, slight reception, as I understand. Um, so the panel will be here. But the last question is actually one that we've talked about in preparing. Um, and so very briefly, because I'm also anxious to hear uh, what you have to say, what do each of you expect going forward with regards to voter suppression tactics? What do you expect to see? More of the same? Uh, yeah, I mean, the mind of uh, people, uh, have, <laughs> the, the imagination uh, can come up with lots of different ways of, of suppressing the vote. Uh, as And that's what led to the Voting Rights Act. And I'm as worried, I'm worried about both suppression, but the other thing I'm really worried about is the loss of confidence in the election system that's coming not from the, not from voter suppression, but from, but from other aspects of the system. And one of the ones I'll just point to is the threats on election workers and the like, because uh, we rely on essentially volunteers to do an awful lot of the work, and then a relatively thin cadre of professional uh, election administrators. And if you lose those people, it's a real problem to run elections that people will have confidence in. And, and, and I worry about that as much as I worry about 
you know, retail level, retail level suppression. Because if people don't think that elections are run fairly, they're not going to vote. And you'll drive agree. people out of the electoral electoral process. I want to agree with both of those comments and say a word about each. In terms of what Brian says, this goes back to the analogy to whack-a-mole. Yeah. And if you look at, say, the laws that have been adopted already, pick the Georgia law, and all of the things that it tries to do to make it harder, especially for Blacks to vote. Um, and I think they will continue in states, if they can, to invent new ways of suppressing minority voting. I mean, in terms of what Pam says, one of the things that troubles me is that in many states, there's an effort to give political officials more control over the election and the results of the election after the 2020 election. And I worry with that, how that's gonna play out if it's a close election, let's say 2024. We're going to close, and I will say that it's been a great joy um, working with this panel for um, uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, well, professionally and personally, it's something that we could talk about um, endlessly. Uh, so I want to thank each of you um, for uh, volunteering and um, all the work that you put into it. But thank you. And we're going to break. Um, and as I said, the 1965, again, I'll repeat for your code. <laughs> Thank you.